and the lights came on. Good morning. Good morning, Eagle Naz. It's so great to have you here today. Merry Christmas. It's not, not too early, is it? This is the first Sunday of December. All the Christmas lights and decorations are, are, are set and ready to go. And uh, Christmas is three weeks from today. And so we got three weeks to kind of get our hearts and our minds and our spirits and all the stuff ready. And uh, we do that in the midst of all the hectic things that, that uh, we have to be a part of. This, this day, today, we're starting a new Sunday morning preaching series, and it's obviously about Christmas. And they've asked me to kind of lead off. I'm the leadoff hitter today, setting the table for the big hit hitters later in the, in, the, uh, in the lineup. So many different directions we could go in kicking off a new series about Christmas. We could talk about Mary and Joseph, the, the earthly parents of Jesus. We could talk about uh, the wise men. We could talk about the shepherds on the hillside. We could talk about wicked, wicked, wicked King Herod. We could talk about that, um, that innkeeper who didn't have any room for Jesus. And we could talk about all sorts of things. But I want to focus in on a, on a character of the Christmas story that I kind of feel sorry for. I, I want to I talk to you about, um, do you think that angel had any idea what he was getting in for? You know, the Christmas angel, his name was Gabriel. His friends called him Gabe. And, and his assignment was to go to all the different characters in the Christmas story and tell them it's time. It's time. All of the prophecies of the Old Testament are about to be fulfilled, and the Son of God, Jesus, is going to come in the form of a baby, born of a virgin in a manger in Bethlehem, and, and he got to go and lay all that stuff out for them, went to them individually to talk to them, and, uh, you know, the overarching um, thing that he was supposed to say was peace on earth goodwill to men. That's the message. Christ is coming. Jesus is coming. Peace on earth. But when you follow along on scripture, as he goes to each of the main characters of the Christmas story, um, it seemed to have the opposite effect on them and their lives. The announcement of the birth of Jesus didn't bring peace on earth to the Christmas characters. It brought the opposite effects. There was confusion, and there was fear, and there was anxiety, and there was stress, and there was chaos, and it disrupted their lives, and it disrupted their relationships. Scared them to death. So Gabe goes, first of all, to Zechariah. Zechariah is a priest. He's serving in the temple. He and his wife Elizabeth, are, the Bible says they're old, and they're not old, they're just very old, is what the Bible says. They may have been older than me, if that's humanly possible. But so here's Zechariah, and the angel shows up. Now, now Elizabeth and Zechariah didn't have any children. She had been barren their entire married life. They were way beyond childbearing years, and the angel pops into the temple, finds Zechariah, and says, Zach you and Liz are going to have a baby. Isn't that great news? And, and I, it's going to be a boy. You're going to name him John. He's not going to be a Nazarene. And he's not going to be a Lutheran or a Catholic. He's going to be a Baptist. He's going to be John the Baptist. He's going to be the forerunner for Jesus. He's going to be the one that, that prepares the way for the Messiah. And, and, and so I, I think Gabe was just so excited to give him this good news. And you know what Zechariah's response was? The Bible says he was startled and gripped with fear. That's what the message did for Zach. It, it, very similar to the feelings you're going to have in January when you open up your credit card bill <laughs> coming off of the Christmas season. You're going to be startled and gripped with fear. And, and, so, and so the angel had to say, don't be afraid. 
I, I, I'm sorry. This seems to be upsetting you. Don't be afraid. This is, this is part of the plan. It's all going to work out. It's going to be okay. Well, next, Gabriel hops over to see Mary. Little, sweet, teenage Jewish girl named Mary who has been chosen to be the mother of the Christ child. And so Zach, I mean, uh, Gabe lays it all out, tell her, tells her what's happening and what's going what's gonna to be coming down. And this is what Mary's response was. The Bible says Mary was greatly troubled at his words. Not just troubled, but greatly troubled. Deep in her spirit, this was so unsettling and so upsetting and she's thinking, and she's thinking, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm, what about my marriage plans? I'm supposed to be marrying my fiancé, Joseph. And what's he going to think when he finds out I'm pregnant and he's not the father of the child? What are my parents going to think? And this whole thing, you know, the angel says, don't be afraid. And she's saying, don't be afraid. Are you serious? This is ruining my life and my relationship. This could cause her family and everybody in the community to reject her. Don't be afraid. I mean, this Christmas announcement is causing all kinds of stress and anxiety and turmoil. So then Gabe, who's starting to feel a little paranoid, decides he better get over to Joseph right away. So he goes to Joseph in a dream and the Bible says Joseph had already understood what was going on. He was a good man. He was a righteous man. He loved Mary. And he didn't want to, to submit her to uh, public ridicule and disgrace. So he had made the decision that he was going to end the engagement, end their relationship, and just quietly move on. He did not want to embarrass Mary. And the angel moves into this turmoil and chaos and disruption. And he says, don't be afraid, Joseph. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. This is all part of the plan. I know it may be unsettling. It, it, it may make you feel really confused. But it's part of the plan you're just going to have to trust. Well, by now, poor angel Gabriel is paranoid. Everywhere he goes, he's disrupting things. He seems to be the bearer of bad tidings, not peace on earth. And so then he draws the, uh, he draws the night shift and has to go out in the middle of the night to a bunch of shepherds, keeping watch over their flocks by night. You, you, you know the verse. It says, there were shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks. The angel of the Lord, it's our friend Gabriel, appeared to them, glory of the Lord's all around. And what was their response? They were terrified. Once again, don't be afraid. It's going to be okay. I don't like this job anymore. The announcement of the coming of Christ did not bring peace on earth to the folks who initially heard the story 2,000 years ago. And, and that whole scenario kind of reminds me that um, the Christmas season, even now, today, doesn't always bring peace on earth. That the Christmas season that you and I are about to experience and have experienced in the past sometimes brings stress and anxiety. It seems that pressure and stress has been part of the Christmas story and the Christmas season since the very beginning. And we all know that the Christmas season can be hectic, can be stressful. Just this week, Pauline and I were, uh, you know, it's, it's time. It's December. Sends me, out to the, sends me out to the garage to start bringing in the bins and bringing in the boxes, putting up the tree. And, and Pauline had no idea what I was going to preach about today, but I heard her say on Wednesday as she's in a box, I've barely gotten started and I'm already feeling overwhelmed. That's kind of what happens sometimes 
at Christmas. You, you, there's so much to do. There's so many preparations. There's so much going on. There's so many expectations, and you want everything to be perfect, and you want everybody to be happy. And it doesn't always work out that way. There's a, there's a wonderful thought-provoking Old Testament verse in Ecclesiastes. Chapter 3, verse 1 it says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. And we hear that verse and we, we, we get excited. Oh, yes, hunting season, fishing season. Football season, World Cup soccer season, all this stuff. But the writer, I think, had a little something else in mind. He began to talk about the different seasons in our life. He said, there's a time to be born, and there's a time to die. There's a time to plant, and there's a time to harvest. There's a, there's a time to weep, and a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn, a time to dance. There's a time to be silent, a time to speak. There's a time for love. There's a time for hate and a time for war and time for peace. And he goes on and on, and he seems to be saying to us, look around. Do you see what time it is? Look around. Are you aware of what season you're in or what season you're about to move into? There's a, there's a Bible story that I find myself drawn to every, every year during this season. It, it, I usually start thinking about it right after Thanksgiving, leading up to the Christmas season. And uh, it, it, it's a wonderful story, but it's got an important message for me and I think for you as well today. I, I, I love the Christmas season. I really do. I love the lights. I love the music. I love the food. I love the decorations. I love the gatherings of family and friends. I love the food. I, I love the desserts, all this stuff. But let's be honest, as wonderful as Christmas is, it can get weird. It can get crazy. It, it, it can get out of control. Our, sometimes our priorities can really get lost in all the Christmas stuff. Again, so much to do. So many preparations. So many obligations. And they just pile up and they pile up. And you can get sucked right into this whirlwind. You can get all caught up in it. You know, you Shopping. Think about the shopping you've got to do over the next three weeks. And whether you're shopping online or standing in line. Think about the spending. You are going to burn up your credit card over the next three weeks. It's going to explode in your hand. You got the shopping, you got the spending, you got the wrapping, you got the stuff around the house, you got the cooking and the cleaning and the, and the lights and the tree and the baking and the decorating, and then you got the parties and you got the rehearsals, and you got the crowds, and you got the traffic, and, and you've got the long lines and the impatient drivers, and, and what we have is time pressure and financial pressure. And the calendar gets full, and we want the Christmas season to be perfect. We have such high expectations for this Christmas this year. It's going to be different. It's going to be better. Everything's going to work out. And, and while all this is going on, in the back of our minds, we're realizing, we're, we're remembering that, that this is supposed to be joy to the world. This is supposed to be peace on earth, goodwill to men, goodwill to spouses, goodwill to kids, goodwill to grandkids, goodwill to our family and friends and neighbors. But how am I going to get everything ready for Christmas? There's an old Greek proverb that says, "If you'll break the bow, if you keep it always bent." 
And we're not talking about Christmas bows here. We're talking about the bow. There's a certain tension, a certain, certain stress that has to be managed. And like I said, I'm drawn to a particular Bible story this time of year that, that kind of seems to speak to the issues that I'm bringing up. It kind of seems to, to fit the season, and, and it speaks to me about priorities, and it reminds me to look around and see what time it is. Because so much, I think, of the stress we experience at Christmas has to do with entertaining and hospitality and getting everything ready and family dynamics sometimes dysfunctional family dynamics, sometimes really weird family dynamics. Like, I'm already thinking, where are we going to sit Uncle Larry, who is a mega-Trump Republican, and how are we going to keep him as far away from Aunt Judy as we possibly can, who is a liberal Biden Democrat, and how are we going to keep political discussions away from the Christmas table? You ever had to face that kind of stuff? Keep them apart. Jesus, please, keep them apart. So anyway, here's the story. It's the classic story of Mary and Martha. Two unmarried sisters, brother Lazarus, they're dear friends of Jesus. They keep popping up throughout the New Testament. They're friends of Jesus. And whenever he's in the area, he stops in to see them and visit with them. Luke 10, verse 38, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. It, it, it's, it's a lovely scene. Guess who's coming to dinner? Guess who's stopping in? Guess who's here for a visit? It's Jesus. And Mary, the younger sister, realized how privileged they are to have Jesus in their home and get a chance to spend some time with him. And so she's decided she's going to sit right here and listen to his every word and just take it all in. And where's he been traveling and what's he been up to and, and how is his ministry going and, and tell me some stories and how is God working through you? And she's just soaking it in with Jesus. But Martha was not sitting down and drinking in. She was about to get uh, her bow really bent. She's getting a little perturbed. The next verse says, Martha was distracted. By what? By all the preparations. By all the stuff that had to happen. And instead of taking some time to enjoy the Lord's presence in their home, she's in a frenzy over the preparations, fixing the meal, getting everything done on time, arranging the table, being a good hostess, and her sister is in there. And, and you, you can just feel Martha's blood pressure. You can just feel the anxiety rising. And, and she just, she's, she kind of just blows it here. And, and, and she assumed that Jesus didn't care or he wasn't aware, she said, Lord, don't you care? And then she pointed at her lazy little sister, Mary, for being irresponsible. My sister has left me, Jesus, to do all of the preparation and all of the work by myself. And so, so Martha's going to fix this. She's going to tell Jesus exactly what he needs to do. She's going to make it better. Jesus, tell her to help me. Tell her to get up off her knees and get in the kitchen 
and help me. Now, I, I understand it's perfectly okay for Martha to want to serve Jesus a nice meal. There's nothing wrong with that. That's basic hospitality. That's commendable. I mean, that's Martha. That's who she is. That's how she's wired. I, I think her, her spiritual gifts probably were hospitality and serving others. She was just doing what she was wired to do. But I, I think the problem got out of hand when, when apparently she started going overboard on this whole hospitality thing, probably trying to do more than was necessary and who knows why? Trying to make everything perfect. And, and, and because of that, because of her distraction with all the preparations, comes the, the, the critical glance and the finger pointing. And so how did, how did Jesus respond? He said, Martha, Martha. Now, I, I, I wish right here that we had a video of this conversation or an audio recording of this conversation. This is where I wish we could see Jesus' face and we can read his body language and we can look into his eyes and we can hear his tone of voice because I don't think Jesus is, is um, scolding Martha. I don't think he's chewing her out or putting her down or being harsh. I really don't. I, I think if we could hear jo Jesus right here, Martha, Martha, I think there would be a tenderness, a gentleness, a kindness, a concern, a wanting to help Martha, to help her kind of see what time it is, to look around, to help her see the big picture. He, uh, he analyzed her stress in two words. He said, you're worried and upset about many things. About many things. But only a few things are needed. Really, really only one, he said. One thing. And he's saying, Martha, Mary has chosen what's better. And we're not going to take it away from her. He, he said she was worried. The Greek word worried means to be pulled in different directions. To literally be pulled apart, divided into parts. The word upset in the Greek means noise, tumult, trouble, bothered. I mean, Jesus looks right at his friend Martha, sees what's going on, and understands that she's being ripped apart inside, that she's just being pulled apart. Whatever has caused it, she's just in a mess. And that she's no longer able to focus on the big picture. The single most important thing that she should have chosen, got lost in the shuffle. Distracted by all the preparations, the unleavened bread, the hummus pie, the date fig casserole, the olive tapenade. Who's going to peel the grapes? And is the lamb going to come out on time? And the timing and the table setting and the dessert and the decorations, all this stuff, Mary has lost sight of what the most important thing, thing was. And what was that? Jesus was there. Jesus had come to visit. Jesus was wanting to spend time with them and connect with them and hear their stories and what's going on in their life and to share with them and to relax. And, and he was trying now to help Martha to look around and see what time it is but she'd lost her way. She'd lost her priorities. She'd lost her joy and her peace and was missing out on the most important thing. Jesus was there. 
See, there's a, there's a time for cooking and cleaning and preparing, and there's also a time to put your pots and pans down a while. Now, some of you are going to leave today, and you're going to say, Pastor Jerry said we aren't supposed to put up a tree this year. And we aren't supposed to have any lights or decorations, and there's no big Christmas dinner. We're going to go through the drive through at McDonald's and have a Christmas Big Mac. That's not what Pastor Jerry is saying. I'm talking about balance. I'm talking about priorities. I'm talking about looking around and seeing what time it is and what my response should be to the time. My friend Ken Miedema wrote a song based on this story. Ken Miedema was a blind singer, songwriter, piano player that I met back in the 1970s. Every, he, he would come to churches and do concerts, and, and he, he wrote most of his own stuff. It was all, you know, original music, and he was a great piano player, and he had, just had a great ministry. Every church I've pastored over the last 45 years, I always had Ken Miedema come and do a concert. It was so good. And he'd be, he was blind, so I would get to introduce him and then escort him up to the piano seat and make sure he got in the right spot, and he would start playing and singing. And then halfway through the concert, he would always stop and turn to the audience and say, okay, throw out a word to me. Throw out a word. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make up a song right now. Just give me some words. And people would start throwing out a word, throwing out a word. And, and, and what he would do, he would, he would take these words and create a song right on the spot. And they were amazing. That particular Sunday, I had preached on this passage on Sunday morning, and the concert was Sunday night. And so when people were throwing out words, somebody said, Mary and Martha, Mary and Martha. And he sat down at the piano and he started to play. He'd always play for a little bit while the words kind of settled in his heart and the, and the lyrics came, and then he started singing a song. The first verse of that song was, there's a time to cook and clean and mend, and there's a time for crying with a friend. Look around. Do you see what time it is? Put down your pots and pans a while. The second verse says, there's a time to do what's proper and polite, and there's a time to break away and do what's right. Look around. Do you see what time it is? The third verse said, are you bound to your mop and broom and stove? Are you bound to walls that will not move? You try so hard to please, and still you find no peace. Stop. Listen. There's another voice calling. The last verse is, there's a time to work without delay. There's a time for putting work away. Look around. Look around. Three weeks to Christmas, and all of us have our to-do lists sitting right there in front of us. And oh, that God would help us to focus in on what's really, really important this holiday season. That God would help us, starting now, to prioritize our time and our energy and our finances and our focus and our schedule, that he would help us seek first the kingdom of God, the presence of Jesus in our homes and our hearts and our families, and, and, and let all the other things kind of find their proper place. I, I just pray that he would help you and me to look around and see what time it is 
and that we'd recognize that, that, that there needs to be time for you and for me to kneel at that manger scene and to bow before the Christ child, that there needs to be time for you and for me to look into the faces of our kids and our grandkids and our family and our friends and the people we love. I, I pray that God would help us turn our eyes on Jesus and look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And that's my Christmas wish, wish for you this morning.